those that are here this morning. Thank you for coming out. At this time, do we have any visitors in our Plymouth family amongst us? If not, please take the time to greet each other. this service today and um, I want to thank them I want to thank you if you're watching the service from afar um, we thank you you know and this may sound crazy but I know that we actually have some people in the Philippines who watch this I know that there's some people in Ghana who watch this service uh, not to mention in Alabama and the east side of Detroit and so uh, we're, I think, really positioned very well to get through this virus. I want to thank our media team, uh, Pat Usery and Attorney Rita White. Uh, I thank you uh, we have been here today, and uh, I don't know who else is helping you, Pat. Uh, Rita and I. 
you and Rita, and then we've got Obina sitting in the house today. Uh, but the interesting thing about it is, you know, I've been talking with some minister friends around the city and around the country about this, and I shared with them, you know, all I wanted to do was to create a better video. And uh, so we've been investing in our video ministry. Uh, in about 30 days, uh, we'll have the high-speed internet up and running at the church. It's already been installed, but they have to uh, acquire city permit. And so what this means is that uh, in an era where people are concerned about social distancing, uh, in an era when uh, we're worried about hygiene and whether or not uh, it's safe to come to church. Some of our members have contacted me and said, I'm, I'm just not healthy. Or I'm afraid that I might transmit something to somebody else or I might contract something. Uh, and, you know, my position is real simple. Number one, if you're sick, stay home. Number two, if you're afraid of going out in public and being in large groups of people, stay home. And number three, if you stay home, one of the things that we can do, we're in a position to do it, is to actually transmit the church service virtually. Uh, we've made a lot of improvements to just the last two weeks in the church's uh, webpage, now you can see every video of the church. You can see them in real time. Amen. Number two, uh, all of the spiritual offerings of the church are there. Uh, my podcasts are there. You can get to my blog from there. All of the church announcements for church groups is right there on the website. So I want to thank each of you for being here today. And uh, I have a favor to ask. I don't know how many of you use uh, Facebook in particular, but if you use Facebook, uh, I want you to think about this, and I know some of you do. We really need to augment the number of people in the church who will simply share the church service. And uh, if you have a Facebook audience of, say, 100 people or 50 people, some of us have thousands of people, uh, friends, a friend base. What I want you to pray on and think about is would I be on Sunday mornings when the church service is over to just share the service with your friends? Uh, I looked at one church today and uh, in Detroit, they had 180 people sharing their service. And that's intentional. And we can do that. You know, we have a lot of people in our church who are doing this. But at a time like this, it's all the more important to just share the word. And if you do that, uh, we will be fine as a church. Uh, I mentioned Obina. I couldn't see in the lights, but we have Brother Byron. Amen. And uh, I thank you. Uh, for all of you for being part of the media ministry. I never thought that uh, the media ministry might be one of the salvations of the church. Amen. <laughs> but uh, we are there now. And so I thank you. And I also want to thank everybody here. You know, I, I talked with the church's lawyer yesterday, Darwin Fair. He said, now, Nick, be sure to tell people that we are discouraging folk from holding hands. Uh, he said, just from a liability standpoint, and we're discouraging people from hugging. You have to do what you want to do. Uh, it's funny, at the Kentucky State concert the other night, uh, before the concert, I was talking with three of our older members, and one of them, Mary Stevens, had an interesting point. She said, you know, I listen on the news, and people say, don't hug uh, and don't hold hands. She said, I'm living with a bullet in my head. Literally, she, she got shot in the head several years ago. I don't know how many of you know her story. But her thing is, she said, I'm living with a bullet in my head. If I have a bullet in my head, am I going to be afraid to hurt somebody? And, and she said, and I'm near 90 years of age. And I said, 
Mary, you'll have to do what you have to do. So I thought that was kind of funny. Is she here today? Yeah. Where is she? Here. I can't see when I have those lights, but <laughs> there's this the woman with a bullet in her head. <laughs> you know, Mary, and I'm laughing about the day, but when you got shot, uh, it wasn't funny. It wasn't funny at all, but uh, I'm just amazed at how remarkable your recovery has been. Amen. 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 So, <clears throat> friends, uh, again, I thank you, and I just want to reassure you that we will be worshiping through this, uh, unless the government shuts us down. We are under the threshold for the state. The state said we have 250 people or more worshiping, then they didn't want churches to worship. But, you know, it's funny, that's about our number uh, at a high point for both of these services. So I think we will be okay. Uh, but again, I thank you. As we prepare to worship the Lord with our offerings and gifts, I just, again, I want to say a word to the video audience today. Uh, those of you who are here, you already understand this. But to those who are looking at us uh, from Atlanta, from Florida, from the Philippines, wherever you're looking at this service, I invite you to make an offering now. You can do it now very easily um, online. Uh, if you're looking at this online, you ought to be able to see it, uh, but you can give through the church website, uh, www.pucdetroit.org, or you can give through the cash app that we're using called Give Love Fly. Um, but to lead us in our offertory sentence, we have Brother Foster. What's your first name again? Reed Foster. Let's put our hands together for Reed. Please repeat after me. Judge not, judge not and you will not be judged. Not be judged. Condemn, not, Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Not be condemned. Forgive, Forgive, and you will be forgiven. And you will be forgiven. Give, much more is required.
those in the church, blended voices. Amen. One thing I like about the third Sunday is the mix of music. Amen. And in this one service, we have both our historical music in uh, Athens and spirituals with the Renaissance choir. And then we have contemporary music with blended voices. Amen. So let's put our hands together.
with God. Understanding that God hears prayer and God will answer each of our prayers. The good news in Jesus Christ is that all sins are forgiven. And what this means is that there's no mistake that you've made. There's no lie that you've told. No sin of omission or commission, which is so grievous, so heinous, as to keep you from heaven's gate. Jesus taught that when we pray, that we must not stand on a crowded street corner or lifting up vain and empty repetition, but rather when we pray, that we should steal away to our prayer closet and pray to our Father in heaven who hears and sees in secret, and God will reward you. So ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find knock, and the door will be opened unto you. Let us pray.
grant us your safety. Grant us your, your presence. Grant us your providence, your mercy, and your grace. Oh Lord God, we pray for Pray for the lonely that they might receive a good companionship. Those who are panicking in the face of this virus, panicking, oh Lord God, with a run on supermarkets, panicking, oh Lord God, with an inability to sleep. And we just pray right now that you might grant us your peace. Lord God, we pray for the lovers today, the coupled people, the married and the unmarried, that we might learn a more perfect way to love one another, a more perfect way, oh Lord God, to listen, to laugh, and to support one another. We pray right now for those who are economically challenged. We pray for those, oh Lord God, who are on shaky ground fighting.
There's a blessing in this house and it's waiting for you. Just have faith to receive it. God knows that you need it. You know, somebody came to church sick today. Somebody else, probably all of us, are here today with some concern about this coronavirus, COVID-19. But I'm here to share with you the good news. The good news is that Jesus Christ knows what's going on. He's provided the world with all the tools to move beyond this with him. Just have faith to receive it. God knows that you made it. There's a blessing in this house and it's waiting for you. In so many other places we can be right now. But we are here today because we know that Jesus is real. He's on the throne and will show us the way out.
but uh, we have efforts underway right now for that. But today, I want to share with you a word of hope from the book of Revelation. And you might say, what hope does the book of Revelation give? But the revelation of God to John is really a book of hope. The first century church was besieged. The first century church was besieged by the Roman government. They were besieged by other little nation states. They were besieged by Christians uh, who were told that if you believe in Jesus, you have to first be a Jew. And there were people who were actually killed for this. I mean, Jesus was killed for this. Peter and Paul were killed for this. All the, the original disciples of Jesus were killed for this. This one reason. And the only one who wasn't killed was John. John, and I have some theories about this. I think that John was politically connected. John was spiritually connected to the Jewish hierarchy. John was present when Jesus was interrogated at the home of the high priest, Caiaphas. It is John who invited Peter to come in to the interrogation of Jesus. And it was Peter who denied Jesus three times, but he didn't realize he could have come in. John was already inside the interrogation walls. You know, sometimes in life, like Peter, we sell ourselves short, amen? amen? And we don't realize that we have more authority and opportunity than we are willing to take advantage of. And so when all the disciples were killed, the only one who survived is John. John, of the original disciples. John is on the Isle of Patmos, and I think that was a concession to John because of a personal relationship he had with somebody. Uh, and so he writes the revelation that God gives to him from the prison island known as Patmos. And I want to read a little bit of this for you. And there's a misprint in the bulletin. It says Psalm 27, but it's supposed to say Revelation chapter 19. And it reads, Then I saw an angel standing in the sun. Imagine that, an angel standing in the sun. And with a loud voice, he called to all the birds that fly in mid-heaven, Come gather for the great supper of God to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of the mighty, the flesh of horses and their riders, flesh of all, both free and slave, both small and great. Then I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against the rider on the horse and against his army, and the beast was captured and with the false prophet who had performed in its presence the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. And all the rest were killed by the sword of the rider on the horse, the sword that came from his mouth, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. I've chosen this text today because it actually is a word of hope. It's a scary word of hope. The images can be frightening. But when I think about the book of Revelation, I see it as a word of hope. I've been reading, writing, and podcasting for the last two weeks on the book of Revelation. And I'm so glad I'm doing this. I wasn't doing this because of coronavirus. It's just the sequence of books in the Bible that I've been podcasting on. And one of the things I like about doing a podcast of the Bible is it forces me, Nick Hood, to read the Bible slowly, patiently, 
and thoughtfully. And as I read the Bible slowly, patiently, and thoughtfully, I always see something different I didn't see before. And if you have not checked out the podcast that I'm doing, I invite you to check it out. All you need to do is go to the church website. We've simplified it. You don't have to go through any other links. Just go to the church website. The podcasts are right there in sequential order. And you'll see, uh, I, I haven't gotten to chapter 19 yet. Today, I will be recording on chapter 18. But I've been in the light of the coronavirus. I said, people need hope. And I said, where in the Bible is there hope? And where is there a greater hope in the Bible than the book of Revelation? And so that's where I want to begin today. People who have lived at various stages in the history of the world, at some point or other, thought they understood what the normal was, the new normal. If you the time of Alexander the Great, that was the new normal. If you lived in the time of Cyrus the Cylinder and the Persian Empire, that was the norm of the day. If you lived during a time of Genghis Khan and the Mongolian Empire, that was the norm. If you lived during the days of the Roman Empire, that was your norm. If you lived in the time of the British Empire, the Spanish Empire, the Portugal uh, Empire, the Dutch Empire, if you lived uh, in Africa, uh, and you, if you lived there, particularly in the southern part of Africa during the time of Shaka Zulu, uh, that was your norm. And if you lived in 2020, the norm is the United States of America. And, and the new norm that some would say is our new norm is the coronavirus, virus, uh, COVID-19. And I shudder when I hear some people say, this is the new norm and we'll be living with it forever. I said, no, we're not gonna live with the coronavirus forever. Uh, we didn't live with Alexander the Great forever. We didn't live with Cyrus the Cylinder uh, of Persia forever. And we will not live with the coronavirus forever. That may take a long time to eradicate it, but with all the billions of dollars that the United States is putting into a solution, uh, I have a lot of hope that sooner rather than later, we will move beyond the coronavirus. Coronavirus. Amen. The revelation of God to John is about what I call a redefinition of the new norm. Uh, and the redefinition of the new norm in the book of Revelation is real simple. You have the forces of God who are lined up against the forces of evil. And chapter by chapter by chapter of the book of Revelation. You have the forces of evil who are trying to chip away at God. And so by the time we get to Revelation chapter 19, we, we get to the climax. And the climax is that the forces of evil are symbolized by what's described as a whore on a beast. That's in chapter 18 uh, and 17. The whore on the beast. Uh, uh, line up the forces of evil against the forces of God. And the forces of God are fighting evil on two levels. There's the cosmic level, which is ethereal and it's in heaven. And in the cosmic level, you have the dead in Christ who rise. Uh, they're called the conquerors. These are people who are beheaded for their faith. And on a cosmic level, the people for who have died for their faith have been risen up to, to fight with Jesus in this ultimate battle against evil. But then you have the living people. It's not just the dead in Christ who are rising. You have the living who are called upon in the revelation of God to John to stand up against the beast and the forces of evil. And why this is significant, I hate to call me out, but 
you know, in the Pentecostal tradition, uh, there's a great emphasis on the rapture. And they talk about how the day that Christ is going to be raptured up to God. But yes, Revelation talks about that. But guess what? The, the revelation is not just about the dead in Christ being raised to heaven and they're going to lollygag all day long in heaven. That's not, if you read the revelation, there's no lollygagging in heaven. <laughs> the, the dead in Christ are raptured so that they can fight with Jesus against the beast. Part of Jesus' army is, it's not just the dead who've been risen. It is the living who are acting like they are the living dead. It's like a zombie apocalypse. And the, the living are the seven churches we read about in the beginning of the book of Revelation. Let's see if I can remember them all. We have Ephesus. We have Sardis. There's Smyrna. There's Pergamon. There's Tyrantium. Uh, there's Laodicea. And that's the last one. And I think there's a reason why Laodicea is the last one. And the reason why, did I say time to you? What did I miss? Philadelphia, the city of brotherly love. But for Laodicea, the reason why Laodicea is last is because the revelation of John says, you're lukewarm. You're neither hot nor you're cold. I wish you were one or the other. And it is to these seven churches that the revelation is sent. Each of these churches represents a different mindset, a different problem in the battle between good and evil, God and the devil. And so by the time we get to the end of the revelation, the battle is fought on two levels. It is the cosmic level, where the dead in Christ are rising from the, the ground up to fight with Jesus. But it is also the earthly level. It's for people, and I think it's more for the earthly level than, than the cosmic level. It's people like you and me. People like you and myself who have gotten lazy. People like you and I who are running from God, fearful uh, of the world. And you and I who have stuck our heads in the sand. Uh, today is maybe the coronavirus. Tomorrow it'll be something else. And what God is telling John is that if the new world order is to take place, it will take place on two levels. Yes, the cosmic, but also the earthly. And you and I, my friends, I hate to break it to you, we represent the earthly. So the coronavirus is for some a quote unquote new normal. And the pertinent question for me is simply this, where do we go from here? Uh, will the end point or the beginning of a quote unquote new normal? And if life as we know it moves beyond the coronavirus, it will only happen because people of goodwill and interest choose not to be content with living with the virus. That's where it starts. When the United States Congress said we're going to appropriate billions of dollars for a cure for the virus, believe me, it will happen. It will happen. And in the battle for the new normal, the beast we fight against, just like in the book of Revelation, the one who's lined up against God is a beast. The beast that you and I are fighting against uh, is not so much the coronavirus, but it is the fear and panic that the coronavirus has produced. Last night, uh, in preparation for the confirmation class today, I said, you know, I better make sure I have enough toilet tissue. <laughs> Why did I think that? I, thought I went to Kroger. All the aisles were bare. I went to Trader Joe. Not only were the tissue aisles bare, but all the hors d'oeuvres were bare, and the frozen vegetables. And I'll tell you a secret, I have eight children in the confirmation class, and this year we have two vegetarians. And so 
I want to make sure that the vegetarians are satisfied. I said, they don't want to eat anything else. I want to make sure there's something they can eat. And so I've been going to Trader Joe from the very first class <coughs> because they have these vegetarian hors d'oeuvres. And uh, the whole thing was bare. And then I thank God I had a couple of them in the deep freeze left over. Uh, but I looked at the lines, and then I went to Lowe's and could not find toilet tissue anywhere. And uh, so it was the funniest thing, but it was the saddest thing. I wanted to cry at Kroger because they had lines of 20 or more people lined up, and I'm in the line, you know, to pay for their goods, and people were stocking up on everything. And I'm saying to myself, at what point do we rise above our fear? At what point do we stop panicking and look at, start looking at life as something that we can conquer and not something that is going to swallow us? And I don't believe this is the new norm, but you and I have to be very careful. The fact that you are here today lets me know you are not a panicking person. Uh, you may have been in a panicky line to get toilet tissue. <laughs> but you are not really a panicked person because you are here. And I thank God for you. Throughout time, more people than not have settled in with what they believed was normal. And this has been true on both a social and a personal level. You think the coronavirus is bad. There was a time when the scarlet fever terrified the world, the bubonic plague, uh, you know, polio, polio. My father had polio. He said the Spanish flu. You can go through the list. Uh, slavery, for some, was the norm. Amen? Amen? But our forefathers and foremothers sang a song. They said, before I be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. The, the people that took that kind of attitude were the people who said, it, it may be your norm, but it's not my norm. Uh, it may be your norm, but it's not my norm. My father graduated from high school and spent six months on his back in a body cast. A lot of you may not know this, but he had scoliosis. Originally, they thought it was polio, but the scoliosis gave my dad a severe curvature of the spine. Unless you, he wore extra large shirts, he was not a big man, but he wore extra large shirts to cover up the fact that during his surgery, they took uh, some muscle mass out of his legs and put it into his back. And so unless you hugged him, you wouldn't know that he had scoliosis. And, and, or if you watched him walk real closely, you could tell my father had a twist, a twisted back. But my dad looked at his life and said, that is not going to be my norm. He looked at his life and said, I'm not going to stop just because I have a severe curvature of the spine. I bet you somebody here has a severe curvature of the spine. There are new ways to deal with the spinal curvature today, uh, less severe than what my dad went through with six months on his back. But when my dad got out of that six months on his back with a body cast, uh, you couldn't stop it. You could not stop it because he was trying to make up for lost time because he did not want the body cast to be his new norm. And the point that I'm making, my friends, is whatever you're dealing with in life that is giving you a second-class kind of life, you need to look at your life and ask yourself, am I going to live like this for the rest of my life? And once you get to the point where you start with that question, am I going to live like this for the rest of my life? That is the point when your life begins to change. That is the point when you decide that 
uh, I'm not going to live a second class kind of life. I'm going to make the most out of every day, the most out of every moment, the most out of every minute of life, because life is too short to give in to a coronavirus. It's too short to give in to scoliosis. It's too short to give in to diabetes. It's too short to give in to cancer. But at some point, you and I have to ask hard questions and say, am I prepared to take my life to the highest level? And so the message that I take away from the Gospel of John in this revelation of Jesus Christ is that God is in the business of making all things new. You know, the last words of Jesus as he is ascending to heaven is, behold, I make all things new. The world can survive a pandemic, but the question I wonder is, at what price? The beast that you and I are fighting against is not quite this image that John tells us in chapters 15, 16, 17, 18, and 19. But the beast that you and I are fighting against is simple fear and panic. So I thank you for coming to church. And more than anything else, I encourage you to rise above your fears. I try to walk every day. I try to walk each day by faith and not by sight. I do not know what tomorrow will bring. But what I do know is that Jesus is real. Yes, there is a war going on. Yes, these are difficult times. But what we fight against is on both a cosmic and on a earthly level, a physical level. There's a battle going on right now, and the battle that's going on now is for your soul, is for my soul. There's a battle going on, and the beast that is waging war is not a physical beast, but it is a mental beast. The beast that you and I are fighting against, my friends, is the beast of fear that has put a grip on some people's minds. So I encourage each of us today to draw down on faith. Draw down on your faith, stand up in courage, uh, move bravely to what lies ahead. Never give up, never give in, never quit, never stop loving. Uh, create a new normal based on what you know in Jesus Christ. And most of all, stand up for the Lord. Stand up for Jesus. Stand up. Stand up for equity and peace. Stand up for justice and mercy and grace. Stand up for the forgiveness that only God can give the world. Stand up for the opportunity for you and me to recreate our lives every day of life. You may have been born poor, but you don't have to die poor. You may have been born out of luck, but you don't have to live out of luck. You may be born uh, with some deficiency, but God will take your deficiencies and transform them into something new. And so this day, my friends, just stand up for the Lord. Stand up for Jesus. Stand up and never, ever sit down before you really. God bless you. Amen. Friends, I got to understand our closing hymn, which is Just As I Am Without One Plea, number 285 in the Red Hymnal. And as we sing this hymn of invitation, we open the doors of the church to any person without a church home. Even on this Sunday, in the midst of a coronavirus and a worldwide pandemic, we are here. Amen. We are here because we know that just without one plea, that the Lord is standing for you and me. Will you sing with me?
unless we get shut down. Amen? Amen. Uh, one of the things I want to do is uh, I want to call on Minister Jacqueline Gadsden to come forward. Uh, she is part of a group of people who joined the church late last year, or was it early this year? Late last year. Late last year. And uh, we did not present the certificate of membership. But Sister Gadsden, today, on behalf of the church, I present you a certificate of membership. And following the service, I invite uh, those who are here to greet Sister Jacqueline Gadsden again and to welcome her to the church. Turn around so everybody can see you. Yeah. 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 We have uh, several more persons coming in from the second service to receive their certificate. But uh, Sister Gadsden, I thank you. She's already getting involved in the church and participating with the uh, Sunday morning prayers and the prayer line. And so I thank you. Uh, will you join with me in prayer? Gracious Master, my God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the hope that you give us, even in spite of the despair of the world. And we just pray right now in your name, O oh Lord God, that you might lead us, guide us, and show us the way. Now to him who is able to keep us from falling, and to present us faultless before the throne of Almighty God, to the only wise God, be all glory, dominion, majesty, and power both now and forevermore, let the church say, Amen. 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 